in a defining milestone in the histories of the Chinese Communist Party and China. Secretary General Xi Jinping kicks off the biggest event in China's political calendar, the 19th National Congress of the CPC. While the Autumn Congress comes as China's endeavor to build a moderately prosperous society has just entered the decisive stage. The international community is paying particular attention to see how China under Xi's leadership will chart its future course. What are the top priorities for the CPC? And how do we envision the future prospects for the China road? To talk about these and more today, I'm happy to be joined in the studio by uh, Zhang Weiwei, Dean of the China Institute of Fudan University, and also Mr. Lawrence Brom, Founding Director of the Himalayan Consensus Institute. We should also talk uh, by satellite to Professor Dennis Woder from Georgetown University and Fraser Cameron. Director of EU Asia Center. That's our topic. This is Dialogue. I'm Zoe. Before we get started, let's take a look at this. Entering a new stage of global influence, this could be a milestone for the Communist Party of China, as the theory of its top leader's concept of the Chinese dream for the great rejuvenation of the nation is laid out. In his report, General Secretary Xi Jinping tells the world the party's aims and how the targets can be achieved. This is our strategic vision for developing socialism with Chinese characteristics in the new era, finish building a moderately prosperous society in all respects, proceed to basically realize modernization, and then move on to turn China into a great modern socialist country in every dimension. We must work with resolve and tenacity and write a brilliant chapter on our new journey to socialist modernization. Past decades of reforms have focused on resolving domestic problems. Xi's reforms have also focused on how China deals with the rest of the world. Many say he's taken a pragmatic approach to respond to changes. He promotes globalization to create what he calls a win-win situation for all. China's economy has maintained steady growth despite the global slowdown. The Belt and Road Initiative and a more active role in matters like UN peacekeeping and climate change, along with the Xi's concept of building a global community of common destiny, have helped put the country in a rising position. Xi understands the party's real threat comes from within. We have tightened political discipline and rules to ensure that political responsibility for governance of the party is fulfilled at each level of the party organization. The report touches on a dozen areas to work on. Further reforms, transformation to an innovative society, improving people's well-being, and strengthening party building. The Party Congress, which comes every five years, is regarded as the country's most important political meeting. The new leadership lineup and amendments to the party's charter could bring changes to a wide spectrum of policies. Xi Jinping's report is a theoretical expression and guiding directions of China's path. The message is clear. China has the confidence about its own solutions, which are coming from inside and work for the best interest of its own development. The policies to be endorsed could bring about profound transformation to the Chinese society as well as the world beyond. Han Bin, CGTN, at the Great Hall of the People. About the Party Congress, let's turn to our studio discussion. Uh, Mr. Zhang, this morning we heard Secretary General Xi Jinping's report to the Party Congress to a large extent uh, to the country. Uh, he basically outlined his vision mm -hmm. for the political and economic yeah. growth for this country in the future. It's bold, ambitious, confident. Mm -hmm. What do you make of his vision? Well, actually, this is a very impressive uh, speech. And uh, personally, I think uh, he offers a vision, a mid to long term vision for the Chinese people, actually also for the international community. Mm -hmm. I think you know, it's a key feature of the Chinese uh, model of development that from time to time you offer a mid to long term vision mm -hmm. and they shape national consensus and moving towards that objective. 
and usually it's done. <laughs> and uh, secondly, I think he shows a kind of confidence which uh, you do not see uh, in perhaps other leaders in the past. Uh, he said, uh, we can offer an alternative, another option mm. for those countries who want to have uh, faster modernization while maintaining their independence. This is a crucial message. Actually, most developing countries desire for this. Mm. And, and Lawrence, what is your impression of what he said? Uh, I think this is a turning point in party congresses. Past party congresses have focused on internal domestic reforms, mm. whether that was creating a market economy or managing that market economy. Uh, however, this is a time when Xi Jinping is reaching out to the world and bringing China to take its place as a driver in not just in infrastructure investment through the Belt and Road Initiative, but also as a leader in the fight against climate, uh, climate change, global warming, it's really stepping into the shoes that have been, have been left uh, empty by other countries and leading with ecological civilization, green finance, and moreover, talking about this concept of China solutions, not the old sort of Washington consensus or IMF World Bank approach of one cookie cutter fits all, everybody has to follow the same model, but saying, look, we have experienced challenges, we've overcome them, some things have worked, others have not, those that haven't worked have been shelved, those that worked we expanded, and this is our set of experiences, we want to share them, mm. and share them uh, with other developing countries because they're relevant. Talking about China's solution, um, Secretary General Xi outlined what he's thinking on China's governance as his thoughts on building Chinese socialism with Chinese characteristics in the new era. Mm. What is in the new era that does it signify? Yeah, it means, you know, China is already very different from the China, say, 30 years ago, 39 years ago when the reform just started. At that time, it's what we call still backward productivity. Now China is the world's second largest economy and China leading the world in the new economies. So I think China has indeed entered a new stage and have to change really the official idea of development from really focusing on quantity into uh -huh. focusing on quality. That's a key word. Upgrading Chinese economy, Chinese industries and move up in the value chain, in the quality chain so that China will be you know, a better China. And, yeah. and also, China's place in the world has yeah. changed. Some people worry that might China become more assertive or even aggressive? Does China look like a menace to other parts of the world? Obviously, Mr. Xi thinks otherwise. I think the Belt and Road Initiative is about sharing infrastructure investment and also uh, expanding the economic growth of other countries alongside China's. And I think in this respect, it's really about saying, look, if you want to have security, if you want to fight terrorism, if you want to deal with these issues, you have to deal with it at its root. Sanctions, bombing is not going to get you there. However, if you're able to empower people economically and respect their identity, then you're going to go much further in creating a more holistic and peaceful world mm. than one which is uh, done by aggression. I don't think that's their approach at all. It's going to be very much about investment but we keep saying one mm -hmm. country's choice of its yeah. past depends on its historical yeah. and cultural context. Yeah. Can China's example be copied by other developing nations? As actually, we say? no. Uh, actually, the message of the Chinese model is actually, you know, each and every country should really focus on its own national conditions, cultural conditions, and then try to find its own way forward, rather than mechanically copying other models. This is the grand picture. But at technical level, indeed, there are certain ideas from the China model that can be uh, actually what being... What are the elements that might be copyable? What are the For others instance, not? actually, in the Belt and Road Initiative, the Chinese are promoting this interesting idea of uh, economic zones, industrial zones, this idea of zones where you can first try out mm. different pilot projects and then to say whether we extend or not. And also, Chinese company can move in very quickly because you may not know the whole situation of the country, but you can at least feel sure that we can do something already in this zone and mm. to benefit both China and the uh, host countries. Mm. Yeah. And, and political speaking, uh, I read an article 
uh, an African expert saying that actually many third world countries, developing countries, should regard economic rights ahead of political rights mm -hmm. because sometimes the first priority is to get people better off rather than get them to vote. First of all, you have to deal with their economic empowerment, mm -hmm. their identity empowerment, and with that comes education and gradually addressing political issues and those political issues have to be addressed within the context of the culture of that country and its historical background. Uh, as Professor Jiang said, this is really, I would say, summarize it as it's about diversified localization rather than monolithic globalization. Mm -hmm. And that I think is really mm -hmm. key in the concept of the China solution. And also uh, China with the rest of the world, especially with big powers like the United mm -hmm. States. Some people predict probably in the next five years, mm -hmm. China's total GDP in PPP terms mm -hmm. can outpace the United States and mm -hmm. become a serious competitor to mm -hmm. the U.S. Mm -hmm. How would that change no, the global uh, geopolitics? Uh, yeah, actually, China's GDP by PPP purchasing power parity is already larger than the U.S. economy. Mm -hmm. That's the IM figure uh, three years ago, the 2014 mm -hmm. figure. So uh, mm -hmm. I even, from my own research, actually China's GDP has been uh, underestimated. So most probably China already the world's largest economy. Mm. It's already changing the landscape, at especially economic landscape. At this moment, out of the countries in the world, 128 having China as their largest trading partners. Mm -hmm. In other words, China itself technically can promote uh, globalization. But will yeah. China be comfortable taking the lead economically and how should China adjust itself to accommodate a different position in the world? It's not only taking the lead economically, it is also in technology. I mean, if you go to the south, Shenzhen, this whole area is now the leader in the world in artificial intelligence. China now accounts for 50% of all investment in research development and commercialization of artificial intelligence. It's now the largest uh, you know, exporter of renewable energy systems to the world, and it accounts for some one-third of all high-speed rail networks. I mean, so China's leading on technology. Uh, therefore, if you look at Xi's speech... And you think it can outstrip the U.S. someday down the road? It's just a question of time. Or there will be serious and competition between the two major well, powers. I think the key thing we have to look for is the words new era that mm -hmm. kept coming up again and again in Xi's speech because I think that is what's yeah. articulating this yeah. party, Congress. Yeah. And if you think about it, 35% of all members of the Communist Party are under 40 years old. So it really, they have to address a whole new generation. It's going to be about smart green and blue. It's going to be about technology and it's also going to be about an integrated process with other developing countries and sharing the experiences. Okay. Uh, now let's bring out Mr. Dennis Werder in Washington. Uh, Dennis, uh, Dennis, well, the U.S., it seems have something of a split propensity in, in how they view China. On one hand, uh, there is negative views, ideological tinged view that uh, it is arch rival uh, of the United States. On the other hand, there is uh, some views that it is highly integrated economic relationship and they must get along in some way. How will the different split views be represented in the U.S. Uh, narrative and the government, of the media, and importantly uh, by President Trump? Well, thank you. With all due respect to your other guests, the United States still has the world's largest economy. <laughs> it has a booming stock market. It is not on its back heels. And just you don't yet. agree by China PPP is moving terms? Uh, actually, the China is already catching up. I think PPP is a mathematical formulation that <laughs> doesn't reflect the real world very well, and a lot of people. But do you don't believe the trend that China is catching up uh, fast? I think China is moving up very quickly, and I think that this was a bold vision by Xi Jinping. I think that what Washington will be looking at is the new promises made of more market opening uh, that Xi Jinping made in the speech. Mm -hmm. uh, they will also look at the fact that he talked about opening the financial sector more to foreign investment. I think these are important statements by Xi Jinping that can help 
uh, create a better relationship, and certainly President Trump, I'm sure, will explore these when he gets to Beijing in early November. And do you believe there is a contrast of visions between President Xi and President Trump about how to deal with the rest of the world? Well, I think President Xi made a remark that clearly was uh, aimed at the United States in his speech when he said no country can retreat into self-isolation. Uh, frankly, he sounded a little like Senator John McCain the other night on this issue, mm -hmm. who also said and warned the president that we should not be going for a protectionist, internally oriented America. Uh, I think there are a lot of people in America who agree, actually, with President Xi on this and disagree with President Trump uh, to some of the thoughts that have come out on America first. But do you still believe in the coming five years that the U.S. and China must cooperate economically? There is no other option other than that. Uh, absolutely. I, I do believe in that, and I think that most of the uh, Trump administration actually does believe in that. I think Gary Cohen and uh, Mnuchin and others, what they're trying to build, and, and Mr. Ross, Secretary Ross, they are trying to build the U.S.-China economic relationship, not tear it down. I think that the comprehensive economic dialogue is off to a reasonably good start. Um, and I think that we will see with the president's trip, Secretary Ross is bringing a large number of U.S. very senior uh, chief executive officers mm -hmm. to Beijing. This is all an indication that for whatever rhetoric the president has used on China, the actual fact is that they want to build a good economic and political relationship with and, Beijing. And, and Dennis, ideologically, basically this morning, Mr. Xi is selling Chinese version of development, China wisdom, China solution to the developing world. Right. How does the U.S. look at this? Right. Well, we know we are in a competition of ideas with China. And uh, that competition is a good competition, a, a hopefully a fair and open competition in the world of ideas. China has proven some things over the last few years about its model of development. Um, and uh, therefore, it has a right to be rather proud of what it's been able to do. It's come up with a very interesting idea in the Belt and Road Initiative for investment. Mm -hmm. um, but we also think that American companies can join in the Belt and Road Initiative and also uh, benefit and help those countries improve their infrastructure. So yes, there are different views and there's a different Chinese model. Um, it's up to other countries to see which model they like better. Mm. All right. Thank you very much, Dennis. So what lies ahead for China in, in the future uh, if it pursues its policies as set out? We'll talk about that later on in this edition of Dialogue. Another very important agenda for this party congress this year is, of course, the election of the new leadership, the Politburo and the Standing Committee members. Mm -hmm. um, it will be a reshuffle of yeah. top leadership. But do you think this kind of political transition will be stable and will be productive for China? I think it's uh, already an institutionalized uh, practice. Uh, you have what I call the selection plus election. If we see the American model is the election, the Chinese model is selection plus election. I think the Chinese model is better. Mm -hmm. and, uh, if you look at the criteria for the top leadership members or standing committee of the political bureau, two terms at least mm. as governor or party secretary of a province, which literally means you, know, you have to govern at least you know, 100 million people before you came to become one of the top seven. Mm. And this extremely demanding. You have to perform during the past 20, 30, or 30, mm. even 40 years and then you have a competent leadership. All eyes watch at you. So you yeah. still believe this process is a very competitive process Extremely for competitive. each candidate. Yeah. That's why many critics in the West mm -hmm. don't believe. Because they really. say the Chinese political system is okay. You don't know. 
how uh, the leaders are selected. How, how do you respond? No, to this? actually, uh, which system is more opaque? We even did not know who will be the U.S. president until one day before mm. the final election. You know, mm. the day after the election, like one day. Because voting is something you cannot decide. That's true. In the no, this is the Chinese system provides predictable predictability. This is crucial in the 21st century: stability and predictability. Yeah, we know the party's orientation for the next 20, 30 years, and then we know the leadership will be competent, much more competent. You just put together the leaders, of the United States, UK, and France, and Xi Jinping together. Mm. You see who you can trust. So <laughs> let's look at the track records. The Chinese system selecting its leaders is it the best, the brightest compared with other systems in the world? First of all, these leaders have to go through many stages of their own career from uh, being at a ministry level, local level, city level, uh, sometimes working in an enterprise, in a, in a, in a corporation, uh, managing, uh, managing budgets, managing infrastructure, uh, urban planning. They have to go up and down the gauntlet of all aspects of government before they get to the very, very top. And that means at least these people have a lot of hands-on experience. Uh, they know what they're doing before they come into a very senior position in office. Mm. Uh, that's very different from our system. You can be, um, in, in America, you can be a community organizer and possibly be president, or you could be a uh, casino operator, as our current president is, and become elected. Um, but at the same time, you know, here you have a, a situation where people say it's not transparent, it's not democratic, but then look at my own country, the United States. It's the Electoral College which has gotten us a number of presidents. But, but the and CPC if you had a referendum tomorrow, people would want the Electoral but College. But one challenge changed. for the CPC is obviously also mentioned by Secretary General Xi Jinping is corruption. This is the biggest challenge faced by our system. How to ensure that the best and brightest are selected, but they are not corrupt? No, actually, if you look at the rise of the major powers, this uh, rise of corruption actually goes together with the rise of major powers all the time in history. Mm. Because literally, you know, the wealth generation outpaces the legal supervision. So you say yeah. something is this unavoidable. At a certain stage, yeah. Some then members of the bureaucracy yeah, go At a certain point of time, it's time to solve the problem. Actually, why Xi Jinping is popular in China? One major reason is he's fighting an anti -corruption corruption campaign. Yeah, and, it's and he said there's no stop good for this campaign. It's very yeah. important in parallel with the campaign as part of the government reforms in the five years ahead is to really build up in the civil service a metocracy that's ha it's rewarded. Mm -hmm. Salaries have mm -hmm. to be increased. Mm -hmm. One reason yeah. for so much corruption in the past mm -hmm. was salaries were so low mm -hmm. and all of a sudden you saw people getting rich overnight, mm -hmm. entrepreneurs and officials had power, a stamp, and they could control something and stop it mm -hmm. and block it for money. So the metocracy has to be all right. compensated commensurately. Let's yeah. bring in some uh, European perspective for that. Uh, I'm joined by Fraser Cameron in Brussels. Uh, so. Mr. Cameron, watching the events ongoing in Beijing at the 19th Congress of CPC, how do Europeans look at uh, what is happening in China or in comparison with what is happening in the U.S. and Europe? How, how do you look at China's choice of this world? Well, I think um, firstly there's no great surprises in President Xi's marathon uh, speech today. I think people here in Europe are looking to see if after the Congress he will actually move towards implementing some economic reforms because that was essentially what it was expected in Europe when China joined the WTO and this is one of the reasons for the blockage in the market economy status and negotiations so we are hoping that um, there will be a reduction in state subsidies for the SOEs mm. and greater moves towards the market economy. But he said China side, will further open up its economy to the rest of the world on a new scale with new dimensions but you're not convinced? No, I mean, we've had this before. I mean, uh, China, of course, has opened up. It's a question of moving on to the uh, next level now. And I think, you know, to take the Chinese economy up to um, a middle income uh, level, it has to open up even more. So that's really the, the, the critical question. And we need to have a, a level playing field, especially with the major um, 
trading partners, Europe and the United States. It seems uh, on those the political side, yes. I think that um, go on. On the political side, I think that um, very much as expected too. I mean, there are different political systems. And I think China, you've just been talking about the way leaders are selected. It suits the Chinese system very well, bringing in leaders from different backgrounds. I think some people would argue that this could be done usefully in Europe and mm -hmm. the United States too. But we have to start from the basic point. We are have very different systems. And Dennis and also Fraser have been talking about mm. China should open up and should allow a level playing field for all investors. It seems all the advanced economies are asking the same thing from China. Has China done enough? Actually, uh, really, it's, uh, uh, you, if you compare the Chinese market, you just look at the cars on the streets, all foreign brands, you know. Chinese market is much more open than many other markets in the world. Mm. I think China owns... For example, India. Of course, much more open. Yeah. So, so I think it's uh, even compared with the United States, you know, if you look at the uh, presence of U.S. companies in China, everywhere, most industries, and then look at the Huawei's problem with entering the U.S. market. Mm. So many restrictions. Mm. Yeah. So Dennis, yeah. how do you respond to this? Uh, Mr. Zhang's view is that China is already opening wider access to f international businesses, but actually the Chinese worry they have limited access to the advanced economies. Well, I don't think that uh, this holds up as an argument because foreign direct investment from China and the United States has boomed in the last couple of years. Clearly, Chinese are being allowed to buy in many sectors of the American economy. Uh, as to market access, I would ask uh, the professor, why is it that a Chinese corporation can own movie theaters in the United States, mm -hmm. in fact be the second largest owner of movie theaters in the United States, and no American company has any access to the movie market That's in China a specific except question for the 35 of market movies. Access you well, are this is a sector by sector. If you look at the computer industry, if the Apple, you know, sold so, so, so well in Chinese market, the automobile industry as well. So really, you have to do a case by case mm -hmm. study. In certain markets, China and is far more open. In certain markets, the United States are more open. For different yeah. sectors to have different deals. Yeah. But you believe, Dennis, that China. Right, is and all we're asking is for more access more. in different sectors. But you believe there's. And a we look forward here to China, China opening China up China more. China open up more. And we hope that trend continues. That's, that's our goal. That's what the Chinese government will hear from the president when he arrives. Mm -hmm. uh, we think that the, this is a win-win okay. economic relationship. All right. Thank you. We're running out of time. Thank you very much, Dennis, and also, Fraser, uh, for your take. And thank you, Mr. Zhang, and thank you, Lawrence. You've been watching Dialogue on CTTN. I'm Zhou in Beijing. Thanks for watching, and bye for now.